Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, I can see that folks are popping on, so we're going to give it just about a minute for people to settle in, and then we'll get started with our panel. Thanks for being with us. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I hope this, uh, I hope everyone is doing well and staying safe and healthy wherever you may find yourself uh, today. Um, it, my name is David Angelis and I'm the Senior Partnership Officer for Crisis Response at UUSC. And it is a privilege tonight to, um, to be here and to, to be here with our USC colleagues and our esteemed colleagues, friends and allies um, to talk about the Rohingya issue and to, to to explore this, uh, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum's online Rohingya exhibit, Burma's Path to Genocide. Um, please uh, note the, that we are, we do have a few guidelines for tonight. All attendees are muted and video capabilities are turned off, so only the panelists and moderators are visible or audible. Um, but you can still type your questions in the Q&A box, which is separate from the chat box. Um, a link to the recording of the discussion will be shared after the webinar, and we've also shared a few links in the, in the chat box um, for, inf for more information about UUSD's Burma program, a direct link to the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum's online exhibit, as well as the discussion and action guide that, that some of our UUSD colleagues put together um, to help you explore a bit how you could uh, work actively on this issue. Um, to get started, we're gonna, uh, my colleague Heather is going to, to lead us in a, a reflection and, and opening uh, uh, reading. Heather? Thank you, David. Um, welcome all, so glad to see all of you here. Um, and when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about the fact that, you know, there's, times are tough for a lot of people. We're in different spaces, so I think, um, this particular reading, which is Prayer for Travelers by Angela Herrera, is appropriate because it's, it almost seems like we're all travelers, even though we can't go anywhere right now. So um, I just want to offer this as a centering before we get into um, this program where we're going to talk about some, some tough things in a tough time. So this is a prayer for all the travelers, for the ones who start out in beauty, who fall from grace who step gingerly, looking for the way back. And for those who are born into the margins, who travel from one liminal space to another, crossing boundaries in search of center. This is a prayer for the ones whose births are a passing from darkness to darkness, 
who all their lives are drawn towards the light and keep moving. And for those whose journeys are a winding road that begins and ends in the same place, though only when the journey is completed do they finally know where they are. For all the travelers, young and old, aching and joyful, weary and full of life, the ones who are here and the ones who are not here, the ones who are like you and they're all like you, and the ones who are different, for in some ways we each travel alone. This is a prayer for traveling mercies and sure-footedness, for clear vision, for bread, for your body and spirit, for water, for your safe arrival, and for everyone you see along the way. Heather, thank you so much for that reading, that prayer. It was really beautiful and, and powerful, and I think incredibly relevant for, for the times, as you say. Um, again, it is just such an honor for those who are joining late to, to be here tonight, and, and thank you so much for joining us on this, uh, on this Zoom call, on this webinar. Um, my name, as I mentioned before, my name is David Angelos, and I'm the Senior Partnership Officer for Crisis Response at EUSC, and it is uh, an immense honor to introduce three panelists tonight um, who are going to talk about the Rohingya issue. Um, and before I introduce them, I wanted to uh, just note that 2020 is a special year for many reasons, um, but it, it also celebrates the 25th year of UUSC support for human rights organizations in Burma and people from Burma. Um, and having, having been at UUSC for less than a year, I can tell you it's a lot of things have happened in a short amount of time in our, in our Burma portfolio, which, which focuses mostly on promoting and, and, and promoting grassroots leadership on the, in the push for freedom of religion and human rights and women's rights and community and activist led movements. Um, three years ago was one of the largest mass expulsions of people from, from Burma to Bangladesh, the Rohingya people. Um, and uh, UUSC has really been called to action and, and connected to this, not only because of our long history of working with human rights movements in Burma, but also because the founding of our organization 80 years ago was during the, the Holocaust as a rescue, opera, a rescue operation among, among children in, in Nazi-occupied Eastern Europe. So in, in many ways, this discussion tonight, I think, brings UUSC and, and, and our supporters full circle to our founding values and the, the foundational um, program and, and aspirations that we really try to do. And that is no longer a rescue mission, but it really is uh, one of solidarity. And, and how we can do that, I think, is building awareness among our own communities and, and really placing uh, the Rohingya story front and center to give them a platform for their own, um, for their own cause and their own movement. So I, I'll, I'll stop there and, and leave room for Q&A later. But um, in the meantime, I, I want to introduce you to three very special panelists tonight. Um, the first panelist is Andrea Gittleman, who is a senior program manager at the Simon Scott Center for the Pre Prevention of Genocide at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, our second panelist is Ms. Weiwei Nu from, from Burma. She is a Rohingya activist and founder of Women Peace Network and a current fellow at the museum. And our third pa panelist is Greg Constantine, who is an award-winning photographer and curator of the online exhibit Burma's Path to Genocide. Um, I've asked each of them to, to speak for about five minutes about their work. Um, we'll have a few questions and then open it up to Q&A to the, to the audience. So um, with that, Andrea, uh, I'll, we'll start with you. Thank you, David, for that kind introduction. And it's really an honor for me to be here with, with all of you. And thank you to UUSC for organizing this. And David is exactly right. The history of UUSC is, is inspirational. And, um, long and I think it's important to recognize all of the great work um, from from the community we actually have a different exhibit that's open in the museum or when the museum is open to the public it's available now and it's about how Americans responded to the Holocaust and the story of Unitarians and UUSC and their rescue efforts are part of that story of how Americans responded so just another thing to to look out for. I'm going to talk briefly about the museum's work and the Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide, of which I'm a part, and just kind of set the stage for um, why we've created an exhibit like this. And Wei Wei and Greg will be able to speak in much more detail about what's happening in Burma and about the exhibit itself. So many of you are familiar with the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum 
And besides the actual physical place and the story it tells about the Holocaust, the goal of the museum is really to sustain the memory and permanent relevance of, of the Holocaust. We aim to support victims, survivors, their families, and more broadly create a world where people will confront hate and injustice in all of its forms and prevent genocide. And that last part of the mission is where our center comes in, the Simon Scott Center, where we try to have, um, we try to ignite these effective and timely responses when we see early warning signs of genocide and other mass atrocities all over the world. Um, we also support efforts to seek justice and accountability when these crimes do happen. And so we work along this spectrum of pushing for early response, relief when these crimes happen, and then redress for the, the harm that they cause. And we've been focusing on Burma or Myanmar in the specific case of the Rohingya for, for quite some time, um, since you know, 2013, although the history of the persecution and violence against minority groups, including the Rohingya in the country, goes back much farther, and, and Weiwei can speak more about that. Uh, in December 2018, the museum issued a determination that genocide had happened in Burma, that the military had committed genocide against the Rohingya population. And so we've done a number of things um, trying to use the museum's voice and platform to um, elevate the, the, the situation, make sure policymakers are taking the situation as seriously as possible, conduct research, we've released reports. And then most recently, this online exhibition that, that Greg has really led is one of the key ways to make sure that people understand what has happened to the Rohingya population and understand how genocide has happened over many years. To the, to the community. Uh, so I'll just touch on a little bit why the museum would create an exhibit like this. And it goes back to our, our core mission, the, the museum. You know, we know that the Holocaust was a unique event, but there are lessons that can be instructive for preventing genocide today and effectively responding to it. We want to make sure that when visitors come to our website or they come to the actual museum, that they learn not only about the Holocaust, but they learn that genocide still happens today. And you can see through the experience of the Rohingya in Burma how the world has failed to, to prevent genocide. We failed to live up to that mantra of, of never again. Um, and I think the, the case of the, the Rohingya is, is instructive because it's one very strong and a very powerful example of the effects of, of that failure. Um, I think it also tells us what more we need to be doing to prevent uh, atrocities and, and genocide today. At a very fundamental level, this exhibition tells audiences that genocide did not end with the Holocaust. It's preventable. It's, um, it's not inevitable. It's a long process for which there are many warning signs. Uh, with genocide, it's not this flurry of sudden unanticipated violence and also um, the communities remain at risk of genocide today. And something that the museum strives to do is guard against genocide denial, whether that's Holocaust denial or um, denial of things like the genocide against the Rohingya. And that's something that the Burmese government and others are, are perpetuating. So creating this exhibition and really drawing upon the experiences, the stories and the words directly from victims and survivors of that genocide helps set a historical record and helps fight that, that impulse from, from too many to, to deny what happened. Um, I'll let, uh, you know, maybe I'll turn it back over to, to David because I think Weiwei and Greg will be able to speak so much more about the history of what has happened to the Rohingya community and also what this exhibit looks like and how we can all learn from it. So David, back to you. Thanks, Andrea. That was a really great overview of the museum's work, and and thank you for your your solidarity and your important work on on atrocity prevention and and genocide prevention. Um, we'll, we'll go straight into Weiwei. Uh, Weiwei, please uh, feel free to share your experiences. We love to hear about your work and your your experience as a as a leading Rohingya activist uh, and and voice on on the issue that that affects your people so so dearly. Thank you very much, David. Um, and it's absolutely an honor to be on this panel with you um with you all and thank you everyone for joining um and thank you to uh, usc to, for organizing this event um and having um a greater focus on attentions and support to the to our people um so it's 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 again um 
Um, I'm right now in Washington, D.C., and really privileged to work with Andrea at the Simon uh, Scott Center. So I've been helping a little bit with the outreach of this uh, incredible exhibit, and also involving in a few other uh, justice work uh, of the museum. So it's it's a really privilege um, and honor to to be you know working with them. I want to bring back. Uh, I want to bring you back to to my story when I was a little younger. Um, when I was, I remember when I was in like primary school or in the middle school. In I grew up in Rangoon. We moved from Rakhine State to Rangoon when we were very young, because of the political persecutions. Uh, my father was an elected parliamentarian and the military targeted him in 1990s. So we moved to Rangoon. So when we grew up in Yangon, um, you know, in, in my classroom, you know, the people always, the ethnicity is very um, like important in Burma. Everybody, whenever, you know, we meet each other, we ask what ethnicity are you from? What, what ethnic group are you from? So I have always asked where what ethnic groups I belong to. And whenever I say I'm Rohingya, and nobody knew. I mean, you know, like young kids to the old, old, older people, nobody knew who we were. And, and then I went back home and I asked my dad why they don't know the Rohingya. And my dad would say that we, the, the word Rohingya is not, recognized and at some point it's been banned uh, you could be punished if, if you say the word Rohingya and you describe yourself as Rohingya but I didn't know how serious it was um, and when I was 18 years old I was arrested with my father and four other uh, three other family members five of us and uh, it was simply, it was not only because of my father's political involvement in Burmese democracy movement, but also it was because he wrote a history book of uh, Rohingya, uh, which is a big, uh, a long book, um, which has been like edited or um, edited by the, one of the most prominent historian called Dr. Benton. Basically, the book is quite credible and it's about to publish. And he already sent it to the censorship board to be able to publish during the military dictatorship. And the regime came to realize his work. So part of the reason that they put the whole family in the prison was because of his work on the Rohingya and being a Rohingya. And that's where I realized how severe it was. And then after seven years, I was released and we were expecting that the country has transformed and the Rohingya and you know, all of us will be able to um, enjoy equality and peace and democracy. Uh, but then, as you know, the th things has really uh, turned out very badly for the Rohingya. And, um, and when the violence broke out, um, I was, I was working with other uh, like Burmese activists and politicians on democracy movement, youth movement. Uh, but then when violence broke out, I was somehow questions. Um, my identity was questions and my origin was questions and they knew nothing about Rohingya. And it was so heartbreaking for me to see like the colleagues and friends that I respect, they kind of uh, like treat me as strangers and uh, stranger and outsiders. So I wasn't, sh you know, it was, I, I was so confused and I wasn't sure what to do. And I wanted, and then the, the hate speech against the Rohingya is all over the social media. And I wanted to do something and I didn't have a platform to do because I was younger, I was women and I didn't have a platform. I wasn't involved in any organizations and we have only one Rohingya political party at that time. And it's full of men, there was no women there. And then we didn't have any civil society organization. Um, and I knew that any Burmese organizations wouldn't accept me. For example, for instance, at that time, it was like for uh, 88 generation um, group and they wouldn't accept me because I'm Rohingya and they started to question my identity. So I, I decided to organize myself and founded this Women Peace Network with aim to uh, 
raise awareness about the Rohingya and make people understand who the Rohingya really is and show the real faces of Rohingya. It's not that the way the Burmese government portrayed who the Rohingya are like bad, ugly uh, people um, always and like, you know, people who marry uh, illegal Bengalis and marries multiple uh, uh, women and stuff like that. There has been like propaganda and prejudice against the Rohingya. So we wanted to show that, you know, here is the the, the, the stories of Rohingya. So it was a, a um, kind of objective to bridge the Burmese populations and Rohingya and giving voices of women and, um, and alternative voices. And it has been very, very effective. Uh, we were um, not only we were we uh, were able to like today we have many people. Of course, the violence has um, uh, changed very uh, like you know the situation has changed over the last uh, several three four years. Uh, but then uh, like four or five years ago, there wasn't any allies for the Rohingya. But now today we have some allies. Uh, that we can trust and work together on the rights and protections of uh, Rohingya and people who see Rohingya as uh, as people of Burma. So I would say those those are some hope and progress that we've been making. And I think it's critical that the Rohingya, um, for the long-term solutions, we build trust, mutual understanding inside the country with the people, so that we'll be able we will be able to change the government's uh, mindset and and policies for the long-lasting solutions. I'll, I'll I'll end here. I'm taking so long, so um, yeah, I'm happy to answer questions uh, later. Lily, thank you so much for sharing your incredible story um of of resilience of hope and of of, of leadership i mean you're really you know a, a credit to your community and the community um i think really just it's phenomenal that they have someone an, an advocate like you to be on their side um uh greg um we would love to, to to hear from you about your your history with rohingya and your thought process in in putting this rohingya exhibit together um most, you know, the in this panel, we, we asked participants to, to take a look at the exhibit beforehand. Um, for those of you who haven't, we highly encourage you to do so afterwards. Um, it's incredibly powerful. And, and a lot of that creative energy and, and, and brilliance is really uh, due to your work and longstanding work. So um, I'll leave it to you, Greg. Um, thanks, David. Really appreciate it. And um, thank you to the UUSC for organizing this great webinar. And obviously, any time to be able to sit as a panelist with Weiwei and Andrea um, is a big, huge privilege for me. Um, and so I'm really excited to be able to share a little bit of the exhibition with everybody out there as well. Um, a little bit of the history behind my involvement with the Rohingya. I started, I'm an independent photographer from the United States, uh, based myself in, in Southeast Asia for a good part of 14 years. Um, and I started photographing the Rohingya in early 2006 um, and was so shocked by what I saw, the stories I was hearing, um, the almost zero amount of attention that story was getting at the time from the international press. Um, that every single year, I just continued to keep going back and photographing more and learning more about their struggles and learning more about the complexity of the story. Um, and every single year, that story would, would change um, and not in a good way. Uh, it always, the Rohingya story always deteriorated from one year to the next to the next. Yet it's also, what people have to realize is that this area of Burma in Rakhine State is a place that is pretty much a, 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 a vacuum in terms of foreign journalists. Um, no one can really get access to it. It's been really hard to, to get accurate kind of um, documentation on the ground. Um, so you're having to, so you're always constantly having to think of creative ways of trying to find one way or another to open up a window into what was happening inside of North Rakhine. Um, so for years I spent with that window uh, being opened through the stories of Rohingya who were coming out of Burma to Bangladesh. Um, 
So over the course of from 2006 until 2017, um, I made about 12 trips to Bangladesh and inside of Burma. Um, and then all of a sudden the violence broke out um, in 2017, which everybody knows was pretty much a game changer for things. Um, during all of those years, um, I was always trying to find, a, find creative ways for getting that work out there for one, because we all know the traditional news. We know the news cycle. There's bursts, attention comes in, and then it just evaporates just as quickly as it comes into the news. Um, but for so much of that news cycle from 2006 till now, um, what's in between those bursts of international news attention is actually, to, for me, was always the story of the Rohingya. What was happening when I was are not on what's happening in Burma. Because that seems to be the tactic for a long, long time with the Burmese authorities in terms of how they have treated Rohingya as well as other minorities. Um, and I had the real great privilege of collaborating with the Holocaust Museum and the Simon Scott Center several times over the last few years. Um, but eventually what ended up happening was this great opportunity to be able to create a I think it's kind of like a once in a career opportunity to take 14 years of work and knowledge um, and try to distill that down into a online exhibition, but also an in-museum installation that can tell different narratives. Um, one is the narrative of actually what has happened to the Rohingya people recently, which is what most people are familiar with. This, these cycles of violence that have been perpetrated to, towards them. But more importantly, and I think this is probably one of the most important elements of this whole entire exhibition and the story that we're telling is what is the history behind all of this? What is the process? How did all of this happen? How did everything, how was everything maneuvered and played out to where a 2017 could actually become a re reality? So the exhibition in many ways follows two different narratives. One is a historical narrative about what has happened, the facts. The other one is probably what I think I'm most proud of with this exhibition is it's allowing a voice for Rohingya to actually tell their own stories in this place that is the Holocaust Museum. Um, so the other part of this story, both online and in museum, is that we follow the stories of a group of Rohingya individuals who all came from one particular village, which was one of many villages in 2017, where there was a well-documented massacre. Do I wish we could have told the story of all Rohingya? Well, definitely. But at the same time, we just, the realities wouldn't allow us to do that. So we had to find one particular group of people that were representative of the entire community as a whole, the best way that we could. And over the past three years, as I've been going back to Bangladesh, I've gotten to know this community of people from Mong Nu, um, and they've entrusted me with their story of going back all these times. And it's their story that's being highlighted in this exhibition. Um, so it's a, you know, in the sense that uh, Wexner Gallery, where this exhibition is taking place, um, is an amazing space. It's three incredible cubed rooms that are, provide this blank slate for us to be able to put this amazing exhibition and experience together. That is not just about the visuals, but it's also about hearing voices um, and allowing Rohingya to have agency and representation in how they tell their stories. So I'm incredibly excited about the exhibition. You'll see that the online version takes a, takes a similar kind of approach in the sense that it has a whole section where it is these in-depth stories of these individuals, yet at the same time, it talks about the how. It talks about um, really these forms of systematic and structural violence that are in, have been pretty much largely invisible to the world in a way that has marginalized, discriminated, and persecuted this community and weakened the Rohingya community, while also at the same time demonizing them in the public's view to a point to where 2017 could take place. And what I've, I think what I've just said there could easily be 
related to past historical events over the past century, whether they're 60 years ago, 70 years ago, or even 20 or 30 years ago, or even in the present. So that's one of the exciting things about this exhibition. And we're really proud of the online version. And needless to say, because of the world of COVID right now, we're just waiting for the, for the, for the time when the, the museum opens up again and people can walk in and see this, uh, see this the installation itself. So I, I'll leave myself open and for any questions regarding the Q&A. But uh, thank you again, uh, David and um, uh, Laura and Heather for inviting me to be a part of this and um, can't wait for all the questions that are going to come in. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Greg. That, uh, we're, we're super excited about the in-person exhibit as well, and I can tell you there will be a, quite a strong UUSC contingent ready, ready and willing to, to go and, and, and be the first people to visit that. Um, um, so just a few questions as uh, moderators uh, uh, in privilege. Um, Andrea, you'd mentioned that the, the Simon Scott Center um, works for justice and accountability. And, and I was curious, um, given all of the crises that, you know, uh, and mass atrocities that are happening around the world, um, what, what makes the Rohingya situation different? And what are the prospects for, for justice and accountability? Thanks, David. Um, there's, you, you've put a lot into to those questions. Um, there's a lot to unpack. Uh, of course, the, the genocide against the Rohingya is unique atrocities against any group of people are all unique from each other. I think what sadly this case has in common with many other situations of mass atrocity is that there were early warning signs. And that's something you see no matter what. The signs might be different, but there's always a long um, uh, kind of buildup of the, the genocidal violence. Um, I think what, what people might think is kind of unique about this case is that it took place within the context of a broader political transition. So within Burma in a way we talked about the, the military dictatorship and we've seen in the past several years, you know, a transition from this military junta to a democracy. And I think this case is perhaps really instructive because a transition to democracy does not guarantee the protection of minorities. And um, that might seem simple, but I think people often think that any kind of transition away from authoritarianism is, is automatically a good thing. And there are so many good things that come with it, but it's actually in these times of political transition that perhaps the risk of atrocity is even greater. So I think that's something um, that this case might sadly remind us of. Uh, you talked about um, justice and accountability, and I think um, there's, there's kind of two sides to that question. Um, if we think about domestic accountability, which is really where you'd want to see justice, close to where the crimes happen in the country um, that needs to grapple with its present and with its, its past in order to, to pave a peaceful future, and we're really not seeing the political willingness to um, really genuinely grapple with these crimes, um, as, as Weiwei can attest to. I mean, there have been some individual soldiers who have been um, tried for crimes, but in terms of the systematic um, nature of these crimes, the institutionalization of violence and persecution against the Rohingya, there's little willingness to, to whittle away at that and to really um, hold people accountable on a, a larger and more necessary scale. Um, there have been some pretty interesting and I think hopeful moments when we think about the international road to justice. So there's a case at the International Court of Justice that the Gambia brought, which turns on whether Burma, Myanmar is violating its obligations under the Genocide Convention. And this is interesting for a number of reasons. Um, it, the case turns on state responsibility, though. It's not a case about individual criminal responsibility, as, as we might be more familiar with. Um, these cases take a long time, and the judgments, um, the effect of it might not really match the demands and the, the needs or expectations of Rohingya victims and survivors. Um, there's also an investigation through the International Criminal Court looking at issues of um, deportation and, and persecution. And there is a, a case in Argentina has been filed under the, the principle of universal jurisdiction all of these cases will take quite some time, and it's, it's unclear when or if um, defendants, including those most responsible in the military for these crimes, will be tried or, or will actually be, be held accountable. 
So I think there's, there's exciting advances and that there's movement internationally. And I think that's really important. And it's something that I think international lawyers are really eager to see. And that's, that's, it's good. Um, but there is this mismatch because it doesn't, it doesn't fully reflect the gravity and the widespread nature of the crimes. And I think it might not in the end meet the demands of the, the Rohingya community who are looking for justice for recognition for the seriousness um, with, with which their, their case should be met. Thank you, Andrea. That was, that was very clear. Um, a, a lot of hope internationally, but um, I, th I think that kind of leads to, to one of our first questions from the audience for, for Weiwei. Um, Weiwei, it, the, this question is from Ned White. Uh, do you think youth and young adult activism um, hold the best hope for the future of the Rohingya people in Burma? Um, and maybe I'll add on to that question of, you know, what are young people in Burma, how are they um, approaching this issue? Um, it's kind of connected to his other question, or who are the international champions and allies of the Rohingya people? Um, who are the domestic allies of the Rohingya people? And how do you work with them? And, and what are the, the movements of support looking like for, for a hopeful future for the Rohingya? Thank you for the question. So first of all, I'd like to say that Rohingya have been in this, all this campaign and this, all these processes, they have been systematically excluded from Burmese uh, society as a whole at large. Um, you know, um, so it's, but from Burmese society mean like there is no attachment or connectivity between the Burmese uh, communities um, and the Rohingya, not only in Rakhine State, but also the whole country. Even in Rakhine State for decades, Rohingya and Rakhine didn't have an, like enough communication due to the divisive uh, practices, divisions, discriminations, um, divide and rule practices. And in um, Burma side, um, there wasn't any communications. I mean, it was sort of impact of the uh, military dictatorship, all, but also there were like since 2012, there were active uh, propaganda and campaign against the Rohingya. As a result, Rohingya are uh, highly marginalized from any activities, not uh, you know in 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 the social movement or any other activities or any other um, you know any other thing. So. There wasn't um, communications, uh, but then um, since the crisis occurred, um, there has been some attention to the people, some interest, and I can say that young people are the one uh, who is more open and willing to listen and willing to open up their mindset and willing to collaborate and cooperate. Um, and at some points, you know, we have more and more, more young people uh, from the Burmese side, as well as from ethnic communities, like ethnic communities, including the Rohingya Rakhine, um, open up uh, and they are willing to work with Rohingya or willing to work for Rohingya. So I would say, yes, young people are the hope. Um, young activism, uh, youth activism is very crucial to open up discussions and to really, um, again, these young people will become one day leaders, um, you know, in politics. So they will hold the, the positions in the politics and some of like, for example, some of the young people that we train now, they're going to be uh, in the parliament or uh, like, for example, one of these uh, young women from the DP, uh, DPNS at um, Ethan Zamao, she was one of our alumni. We provided, we've been providing like capacity building youth political leadership trainings for about uh, five, six years. So, you know, we've seen that um, the young people change the mindset quickly and they're willing to co cooperate and coordinate. So I think it's crucial that we support young people and also uh, not just support, support, but also, you know, uh, having a greater focus on these inclusions and uh, equality and justice for all. Sometimes uh, when we talk about, um, you know, supporting young, young people and moderate, moderate groups, uh, it's also crucial that they understand uh, the core and the principles and we, we promote. Um, 
I am always, um, you know, I'm always advocate to for the youth and women to, to, to empower, but also there has to be a, a more strategic approach to it to really, you know, for uh, to really empower uh, the the empowerment of like the values and the principles of like inclusive society that's that's crucial and at the same time we need to empower the rohingya themselves for example we because of these marginalizations and exclusions um whether inside the country or outside we don't have much space for our own and people tend to exclude us in many discussions and many many events or in decision makings so it is crucial that we are able to create our own uh space once we have uh, uh once we have capacity and knowledge and we are able to create our own space for example in my case in many situations in burma uh, like i have been uh, excluded uh, from the discussions, but then once I become bigger and bigger, it's harder for them to 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 exclude. So it is crucial that you equip equip the Rohingya themselves to be able to create their own uh, their own space. Um, yeah. Thank you, Weiwei. That that's really um, really insightful. Um, we we have another question that I, I I'd like to pose to both Greg and Weiwei. Um, Lise Adams Sherry asks, uh, she'd like to hear more about how Buddhist monks contributed to the persecution of the Rohingya. Um, she says she was surprised to see that they had, um, you know, contributed to this persecution. And she's wondering if some of them had had a change of heart. Greg, um, I know in some of your, um, I can't recall in the current exhibition, but I know in some of your previous exhibitions, you've taken photographs of Buddhist nationalist rallies and protests. Um, so could you share any of your experience about um, covering and photographing um, Buddhist monks uh, or uh, Buddhist anti-Muslim uh, movements, and, and Weiwei, I, I, we'd be we'd also love to hear your experience of you know living in a country that you know that is uh, majority Buddhist and, and that has had extremist movements. Um, I, I think one of the it must have been maybe five years ago now. The cover of Time magazine had a picture of a very prominent Buddhist monk. Uh, with the with the headline the the Buddhist bin Laden, um, and, and, and so that that comes to a lot of surprise. Uh, it comes to the surprise of a lot of people here in the West, um, just because of our um, our I, I, I suppose the stereotypes that we hold uh, about Buddhism uh, and being a peaceful religion. So, um, Greg would love to hear about your experience and way way to to hear yours as well. Um, thanks. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think that. Um, this would have been back in 2014. Uh, I mean, one of the things that's really fascinating about this story is that, you know, um, as Burma has opened up, um, it has led to new opportunities for the government, for the military, to be able to shape people's minds, influence people. Um, and as the government opened up and the, the country opened up mobile Phones came into uh, effect. People had access to mobile technology. Um, what was once a way of influencing and spreading propaganda through print publications then turned into the use of the internet and particularly Facebook as a great platform for the military to help reshape minds. Um, and as also at the same time, it was an opportunity for um, some very uh, specific groups of people within Burma to try to influence the way that people felt about Muslims in Burma and also about the Rohingya community in Burma. Um, and one of those surprising groups was, uh, you know, a group of, of Buddhist nationalists um, that had a, a huge flat platform to be able to spread xenophobia towards about the Rohingya community. Um, in 2014, after all of these years of photographing the Rohingya community and actually, in a way, seeing the byproduct of that hate and how it affected people, um, I was fortunate enough to be in Sitwe, which is the capital of the Rakhine state, um, 
to photograph uh, uh, an anti-Muslim, anti-Rohingya demonstration where several thousand people came out, not just from, not just Buddhist monks, but other pe normal civilians from the Buddhist community there, from the Rakhine community, to voice their hatred towards this community. Um, and it was really the first time where I was actually able to see, feel in a sensory way, the origin of that hate. Um, the, the directing of that hate from ordinary citizens towards this particular community. Um, so I think that, you know, one of the challenges with this particular exhibition is that how do you actually articulate and translate this small group of people within Burma that are so hateful and racist towards this particular community and others um, in the community in a way that does not... Uh, say or generalize that all Buddhists in the country take the same exact kind of mind frame, which is not, which is totally true. I mean, most people in the country do not share this venomous hatred towards this particular community, but it's an important part of one of the tools that was used to actually weaken this community um, and also spread the acceptance of violence towards this community through the main citizenry of the country was instigated by this small group of Buddhist nationalists, which is a very crucial part of this story. Um, and I feel like that was a really important part of the story for us to be able to tell. You'll see that on the online, there's, I think, I believe it's chapter number three. All that chapter does is basically try to provide really interesting entry points for people that kind of show all the different tactics that have been used recently and in the past to try to other the Rohingya community in a way that made it acceptable for ordinary people to accept the exclusion, the discrimination, the racism, and the violence that was perpetrated towards them. So it's, it was a really interesting part, at least for me as a photographer, to see and witness firsthand, but also at the same time as a storyteller and the curator and working with this amazing team at the museum, how do we insert that into the narrative of this exhibition? And, um, and I think we did it really, really well. Thank you, Greg. Weiwei, did you want to comment? Yeah, thank you, Greg. Um, that is right. Uh, but I also want to say that when I grew up, I was, um, we had a great respect uh, to Buddhist monk because the, uh, the street that I was uh, growing up was surrounded by the Buddhist monasteries. And um, my parents, I was told by my parents even not to step on the shade of the a Buddhist monk, so that's how we pay respect. And it was so shocking for me to see when Buddhist monk killed the Muslim children alive in in Maitila city, uh, when the 33 Muslim young kids were um, burnt alive and killed by the Buddhist monk, and you know, crowd. Um, it was so shocking, and I couldn't believe that happened in front of uh, eyes. Like it was, it was like extremely shocking movement, moment. I was in 2014, at uh, 13, 2013, and so it's it's unbelievable what is happening to 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 our country. But at the same time, as Greg said, it's not all Buddhist monk. There is. I think there is there is level of um, hate and um, actions. So there is there was an active, of course, a Buddhist monk group, organized group to um, to promote hate speech against the Rohingya, and um, and the group has seems to appear to be a little calmer now. But their activities are ongoing in the ground at the like, for example, they've been working very closely with the communities now with the sun, they establish um, many Sunday school across the country where they teach hate uh, to the kids. And that has been ongoing. But then the Buddhist monk that David um, and uh, Greg was uh, referring to, 
NLP has been silenced um, and NLD has uh, put up a warrant against him. So there has not been very public uh, in hateful incitements or hate speech ongoing. However, the activities of that group is ongoing in the ground. Um, and um, at the same time, so I, do, I, do, I also want to mention to one more thing that I came to realize over time, which is very crucial. In the past, we thought the military was a uh, problem. Um, military was the one who created all this, but then that is true. But then we also started to realize it's not just the military, but the mindset of the people. You know, if we don't have military, even if we don't have military t today, the persecutions the, of the Rohingya will continue because there is a deep um, mistrust and hate and prejudice against the Rohingya. Also, there is um, the Burmese uh, are sort of, you know, the, 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 the prejudice that the, these people don't belong to, to the country, to Burma, and they don't deserve equal rights as other Burmese uh, people. It's been deeply rooted um, in, 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 in the mindset. So it's, it will be really difficult. And I feel like we still have a very long way to go until unless we're able to change the mindset of the Burmese people, we won't be able to really gain, um, you know, uh, justice or restore dignity and rights of the people. So yes, the, um, you know, holding perpetrators accountable, bringing justice uh, for the crimes that have been committed against the Rohingya is crucial, essential. At the same time, we also need to invest so much on changing mindset of the people at large. Thank you, Weiwei. Um, the we, we, we have one question uh, from um, uh, Donald Lancaster uh, from the EU, First EU Church of Indiana. Um, and his question is, is, is very direct. How can we make a difference in a place that most Americans know nothing about? Um, how can we change these deep-seated prejudices? Um, I, I don't think, uh, personally, it's up to Americans to change the deep-seated prejudices of people from Burma. But I think it, it, it's, and please correct me for, if I'm wrong, um, the Weiwei, if you disagree, I think it's about supporting people like Weiwei um, to, to work with you know, people from her, from her own community to, to uplift her voice and, and voices like hers to know the community and have lived in commu the community or from the community to build alliances and solidarity. Um, but the, if, if, um, if you take a look at the discussion and action guide, there are some clear uh, policy actions that, that, that the U.S. could take. And Andrea, I, I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about U.S. policy towards Burma and what specifically Americans can do vis-a-vis um, -vis their legislators, vis-a-vis -vis their, their elected leaders, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the State Department, about what, what type of actions could be taken to really change um, the calculus and, and put pressure on, on, on both the government and uh, effectively the people in Burma. I think you've you've um, said that really well, David. Um, ultimately, change is going to come from within the country itself and from leaders like Weiwei who are going to take their country forward. Um, I think in terms of the U.S., what we can make sure is that the U.S. is on the right side of responding to genocide. Um, the U.S., but everyone, the entire world failed to prevent this from happening. I think um, it would be helpful going forward to make sure that our leaders have the ability, the will, and the courage to stand up to um, to genocide, what it happens if to press for justice and accountability. I think it would be helpful if um, the, the US and others were to uh, formally make a determination that genocide had happened to recognize the seriousness of the crimes. It meets the legal definition, as I mentioned, the museum had, had issued a determination of that nature. I think that could be a meaningful step, but not sufficient in itself. I think there is much more that could be done in terms of standing in solidarity with the Rohingya, but also with many other ethnic communities across the country who continue to face atrocities by the Burmese military. The U.S. has done a lot. Um, Congress has been very strong, I think, in making sure that we are not um, supporting 
uh, the, the military and its crimes, but I think we can make um, just unequivocal how the U.S. stands when genocide happens all over the world. And I think all of us have a role to play in making sure that our government is reflecting those positions and that we have the kind of moral response when we see early warning signs, when genocide happens, and afterwards to make sure that we can do everything in our power to respect and attempt to restore the, the rights of, of the Rohingya and others who have been threatened. Thank you, Andrea. Um, and, and a related question um, from, from Ned White, uh, who are the allies of the Burmese government helping them resist accountability for their actions against the Rohingya? Um, might be getting a little too much into geopolitics, but we'd, we'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Um, Weiwei and Greg, please feel free to, to chime in. So I think um, allies is very obvious. I mean, the big ally uh, is China and then Russia and some of the countries that uh, have like stronger economic relationship with the Burmese government such as uh, Belarus, Pakistan, and some of the, like Burmese government mean Burmese army, like close uh, relationship with the Burmese army in terms of like arm trades and others. Um, and Japan was uh, a strong supporter uh, until recently. It seems like they shifted their position this, like it, recently, like in a couple of months. Um, so, yeah, the strongest supporter is China and then Russia and, um, and ASEAN countries uh, like Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Indonesia, Indonesia, you know, a bit, and um, other Vietnam, Singapore, and other ASEAN countries. So, uh, Burma have been relying on them so much in terms of in, in, in international fora. So, ASEAN have been backing up. Uh, I mean, China back up like in the like main discussions um, in, for example, in um, in the discussions around like decisions around fact finding missions or you know double I double M or uh, in Security Council. But then in other discussions, it's been always ASEAN who back up um, the the Burmese government. So. We've been trying to. It is. It will be extremely difficult to change the positions of the China and Russia, um, but it's appear uh, that if there is a strong evidences and stronger push, at some point they remain silent. Uh, I'm talking about, for instance, the 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 referral ICC referral, or even the like. Um, uh, like the, 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 for example, um, the budget around the uh, double I for the international investigations mechanisms on Myanmar, uh, double I, double M. So in these main discussions, there have, if there is a stronger uh, support and evidences and supporting evidences, they remain silent. But then ASEAN have been a little bit disturbing. Uh, China and Russia might not be easier to approach to change their positions, but there is a, still a room, although they're very disturbing, there is still a room for, for the ASEAN advocacy and to do more advocacy with some of the ASEAN countries like Thailand and Indonesia, or even Malaysia. Um, Malaysia have been a little bit uh, supportive of Rohingya, but it's not as strong as we would want to see. Thank you, Weiwei. Um, we have a question from, from Wade Griffith, which I find uh, quite surprising, uh, quite, quite interesting. Um, and it, it says, surprisingly, we have found that people are less inclined to invest in humanitarian work in Burma because of what the government has done. Uh, how do we prevent a cascade of harm to other vulnerable ethnic populations there who are assisted by NGOs that rely on foreign-based philanthropy? Um, I think it's a really great question, um, and one that I think hits at the heart of foreign aid. Um, but I think there's an incorrect assumption in this country, in, in this comment, in that um, people have been less inclined to invest in humanitarian work. Um, I think if you actually look at the numbers, and this is something that USC is actually going to be doing in, a, in an upcoming report um, of looking at particularly US government aid from 2012 to 2020, is that um, the investments in social development, humanitarian aid, pro and aid programs have actually increased exponentially in the country since 2012 
in support of, uh, presumably in support of the democratic transition. And those programs have essentially been put into place because the, there is this hope that Burma is the new frontier. There's a lot of work that can be done. Um, but they have not, and, but they've kind of been, um, how do you say, the, uh, they're sacrificing the values and not addressing the actual genocide that's happening um, in exchange for government access and access that gov the government controls. So um, I, I would say the, and, and please, uh, I would love to hear your comments, um, uh, folks on the panel, is how do we prevent a cascade of harm to other vulnerable ethnic populations? I, one of the most inspiring things that I've seen from from Weiwei and from other other ethnic uh, Rohingya activists, Tunkin from from BRO UK in London, um, Yasmin Ola, a, a Rohingya refugee in Canada, is the solidarity that they've shown with other ethnic communities across the country, um, and they see their struggle and justice for the Rohingya as justice for all of the other ethnic communities in Burma who have suffered from human rights abuses perpetrated by the military. And I think um, that is incredibly important. And the solidarity that the Rohingya leaders have shown for among other ethnics, that they are a part of the country, that they do want to see justice. Um, I'm sorry I'm talking too much as a moderator, but um, I think it's our responsibility as, um, uh, as a donor, frankly, to, to know the, the landscape that we're operating in that we're operating in and to ensure that we are um, being responsible in building those solidarity links when we can. And I think that's definitely one of the uh, a crux of USC's work and the work of, frankly, the museum of, of, of Greg's exhibitions and, of course, of Weiwei's programs in Yangon and internationally um, and, and that I've really seen as flourishing over the past few years. So it's that international solidarity, which I think is, is incredibly important to cultivate. Um, and domestic, domestic and international solidarity. So um, I, I realize we're at eight o'clock. Um, would love any final thoughts on from the, from our panelists about what you all hope that USC uh, members and, and other folks will get out of watching, uh, out of seeing this ex exhibition, either online or in person. Um, you know, very briefly, uh, your your top thoughts on what you hope others could would be able to gain. Um, Andrea, could we start with you? Sure, and thank you, David. Um, I think at, at a very basic level, I'm hoping that people will look at the online exhibition and really listen to the stories of the Rohingya people, because it is quite rare. I think in a lot of Western portrayals of the genocide and a lot of the news articles, um, we, we don't often hear directly from people. We don't hear their own words. And I think that is a, um, a unique, uh, I think, opportunity that this exhibition offers. I would think for the next step after kind of listening to those stories, I'd hope that people will then think about how this relates to their their own life. Even if you're you're not from Burma, even if you have never been there or are from nowhere near there, these issues are sadly universal. These issues of, of hate and um, othering and persecution and violence. And to think about how this impacts them and what this might mean in the future. In the future, there, there I undoubtedly will be early warning signs of genocide in too many places across the world. What will that mean in terms of our response? How should we think about our responsibility in those cases? And I'm hoping that that thought process can, can be started on an individual level as well. Thanks, Andrea. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, thank you. So the the exhibit is incredible in a way that, you know, even by seeing a few stories, you can imagine how big it can be when we talk about one million or two million Rohingya. Um, so, yeah, I think you know, expanding your thinking and knowledge will be uh, incredibly powerful. And also, you know, remember that this is not the history we are talking about. This is the real life, and it is ongoing, and uh, it is an ongoing situations of millions plus people. Um, so, you know, just try to support as much as you can, whatever you can. Try to understand the situation better. Support the communities directly, as well as you know like uh, put pressure on the government, US government, which has been very silent lately. Great. Thank you, Weiwei. Greg, any, any last words? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I'll just build on what Andrea and Weiwei said. I mean, I think that you know one of the one of the really um, unique characteristics of this exhibition is not just that you're being exposed to these really personal um, individual stories, but also it's I think one of the really unique characteristics characteristics of the exhibition is that it's it's kind of like asking a question of you know what does genocide actually look like today you know in a sense um, is it compartmentalized only to this spontaneous event of murderous violence yes it is part of that but also at the same time there is a process behind all of this that doesn't take on that physical violent form which actually in so many ways can be even more damaging to an entire community moving forward in the, it, with, the fu with their future, meaning the othering, the stripping and denial of citizenship, of access to rights, of access to political voice, of access to movement, of jobs. I mean, all of these things that we here in the United States and in the West and in most places almost take completely and totally for granted. I mean, one of these components of this genocide is this invisible violence, this systematic structural violence that has happened incrementally over a long period of time, decades to actually come to fruition to where it is today. And I think when you look back historically, you'll see a lot of similarities. And I'll build on what both Andrea and Weiwei said. I mean, this is an exhibition and a story of a community that at one point in time was very active and incredibly engaged and very much part of the fabric of larger society. Um, and it's taken decades for the perpetrators to kind of remove this community. And I think in many ways, this community is, through this exhibition, is trying to just show how much they want to go back to that particular place and how much they actually, uh, the injustices of, of denying them that, that place as well. So. I think this, this, this exhibition actually poses a lot of really interesting questions without providing a bunch of answers. And that's always a really, really important thing, I think, these days is for people to, to expose themselves and let them walk away with, with a lot of questions that they need to then go out and find answers to. Um, and because the UUSC is so involved with Burma and, and programs that are really valuable in Burmese society, not just with the Rohingya, this exhibition opens up a lot of different, uh, really interesting places for people to, to ask questions and think. Thank you so much, Greg. Thank you, Weiwei, and thank you, Andrea. Um, it has been an incredible privilege to, to speak with you all today. Um, to all of our, um, our attendees who are, who are still there, thank you all for staying past, um, eight, past the hour. Um, Highly encourage you to to go through the online exhibit and and when when things kind of normalize to to visit the Holocaust Memorial Museum in DC to see the the in person exhibit. Um, the uh, the online exhibit link was in the chat box. You can also find a link directly to it from the USC webpage. Uh, and there's also uh, uh, that PDF discussion and action guide, which could give you some ideas for how to be involved more locally here in the US. So. Um, with that, we'll close this evening's webinar and, and, and express our thanks one last time. So hope everyone stays safe and healthy and thank you all.